So, um, huge thanks to all of you. Uh, uh, I think this is the most vital group of uh, patients, caregivers in the world, and I think in San Francisco we're just going to do it better and find the first uh, therapies, and I think we're all engaged in that already. So, huge thanks. Yeah. Um, huge thanks to Lou Reed, Steve Schwartz from the Hillbloom Foundation who support our healthy aging studies. Uh, Joel uh, now is getting uh, close to a thousand of you uh, who are healthy, uh, who are teaching us how to stay healthy. So uh, also a huge thanks uh, to all of you who participate in the kind of work that Caitlin talked about. And Caitlin is a Hillbloom fellow. So uh, anyways, thanks for that. Um, uh, uh, if you uh, like uh, Josh's film, uh, we'd love your thoughts about uh, the next steps. Uh, what would be the most important film that Josh could make? Uh, uh, these 10 minute videos we think are going to be a series about brain health that address questions that people don't really know about. Uh, in the movie, um, you know, at the end we thank Bob Levinson. I have to thank again Bob. He has really been the pioneer in this uh, space, taught us how to study empathy, and, uh, uh, you know, we're incredibly grateful to Bob. A um, couple other comments. Uh, uh, turn your clocks forward tonight. Um, and uh, uh, if you're interested, uh, in hearing more about our program uh, on Jane Pauley uh, tomorrow morning, uh, CBS, Good Morning America, uh, uh, one of our couples who work in Melanie Stevens' Art and the Brain group are, are going to be featured. So uh, that's going to be on Jane Pauley. And then I promised that I would uh, answer two questions from people in the audience. One was stimulated by Josh's uh, film about uh, pollu uh, about uh, global climate change, and we think this is important. And I think uh, pollution in particular, the data is emerging. Uh, Los Angeles, for example, it's pretty clear if you live next to the 110 freeway, you seem to have a higher prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. So I think as these uh, you know, issues start to threaten our societies, I think more and more, I think um, you know, the global becomes part of the local protection of our brain. So it's something to think about. And then also a really good question about Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Uh, do we see them together more than we should? Yes. Uh, do we understand why? Not exactly. Uh, but it's pretty clear that uh, misfolded uh, Alzheimer proteins may be a trigger for the Parkinson proteins. I think this is uh, hopeful also because I think it means that if we develop better treatments for Parkinson's, uh, this will have relevance to Alzheimer's and vice versa. So this, this is a very important area. In our new Wild building, we are going to be sitting right next to the uh, people um, who run our movement disorders clinic, and I think we're going to learn a lot uh, back and forth. So, yeah. So uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Levinson, Bob, come on up and answer the first few questions, and we'll just kind of tell you when we'll have to move on. So as many as you can. Okay. Well, mine are easy because they're really three of them are about the same thing, and we actually, and it has to do with how the things change over time for caregivers and one of the things that those of you who are in a caregiving role know is that it's a moving target and the, the demands of caregiving change from month to month and, and the challenges are different at different stages of disease and so as a result you never can get comfortable. It, it's always a moving target. Uh, so let me let me answer these questions. So the first question that several people asked was, um, is there any research about what happens to caregivers after they're no longer caregiving? Um, and it turns out that there's one really high quality s survey that was done uh, by a fellow named Richard Schultz, and it the the news in that is pretty good. That um, many, many caregivers uh, sort of bounce back from the uh, the problems that they've been having during caregiving uh, afterwards, and um, and so th as a group, there is a every reason to expect that um, things will be better later on for the caregiver. 
Now, as is always the case, not everyone has the same outcome. And one of the things that Jennifer uh, and I are hoping to do in, a, in another new project we're working on now is to go back and really study all of the caregivers who have been, we've evaluated uh, over the years, which would probably by the time we do it be about 800, and try to understand whether, what are the factors that determine whether after caregiving people do well or not. So this is another one of these mysteries and very important. Um, the other, another question uh, was uh, about, are we getting this sort of a database together that has tips and solutions for caregivers? Um, and I think that's a great idea. Um, we have lots of good ideas. Uh, there have been hundreds of studies that have been conducted that have shown things that can be helpful for caregivers. Now the problem, and this is the thing that we're really grappling with, is that as the demands of caregiving grow, caregivers have less and less time and energy to engage in these kinds of activities. So um, you may not be able to go to the gym and exercise. You may not be able to go to the mindfulness training group. I think the one thing, if I had to give you one piece of advice, if you had to keep one thing going in your life, don't allow yourself to get isolated from other people. It's very easy as caregiving progresses to just be at home, cut off relationships and contact with friends and families. In every, I think the most common theme in the literature is that social connection, uh, very much in line with what Josh was talking about, if you can maintain that, you're gonna do better. Uh, so, so fight against that tendency to just say, look, I'm, gonna, it's, I'm just going to let my social world disappear for a while. Stay connected, stay involved. Um, and uh, it can be difficult, but I think that's a really important part of it. Um, so those are the two things I wanted to talk about. Zach? Great, thanks. I've got uh, about uh, four themes for questions, and, and uh, uh, maybe the first is, um, uh, I probably should have uh, uh, mentioned some of this, uh, but people want to know um, why do people have hand preference? You know, what, where does it come from? Uh, and that's still a, a big mystery, uh, but we know that there's a lot of genetics involved uh, and that it's unclear genetics. So I'm left-handed, neither of my parents are, my brother and sister uh, are, are all right-handed, but my father's sister is left-handed. So it runs in the family in, in sort of convoluted ways. So if you have a, a parent or a child who's left-handed, then you may be a little bit left-handed yourself. Uh, and then folks uh, asked about, um, well, what happens to the brain if, if I was left-handed originally and forced to be uh, right-handed? Um, and, and that's something that uh, taps my empathy circuits and, and, and the like that, um, uh, you know, this still happens. And, and it's very sad that that would ever happen. Um, uh, but um, uh, there are some studies that suggested maybe an increased prevalence in stuttering and the like. Uh, but for the most part, um, uh, I would still consider you, if you were ever to be forced right-handed, to be one of us, to be left-handed. Um, and, and that maybe that added a certain resilience, that maybe you're using, you know, sort of more of your brain in a way than, you know, maybe I'm lazy for not using enough of my right hand. Uh, so uh, maybe we haven't seen the benefits of something like that, but I would, would never want somebody to be something they aren't. Um, and then uh, uh, even a question about, um, well, what did all this mean for right-handers? Um, and so, uh, you know, what I think is going on there, um, it, it, we're, we're all heading in the same directions, and, and so that um, uh, left-handedness may have been overrepresented in some of these rare disorders, but I think if you get, if you make it past age 65, um, as a left-handed person, uh, maybe we're at a selective advantage. And so I, I would say for right-handers, uh, if, if we're made, made it past 65, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, uh, then um, uh, a fascinating question here that somebody said, um, well, if, if you see this um, uh, connection between frontotemporal dementia uh, and, and people becoming more artistic, uh, is the reverse true? 
um, you know, would somebody who is more artistic uh, be at risk of developing a, a disorder? In this case, they said maybe even something like a memory problem. Uh, and gosh, I hope not. But um, but we have done studies. I think um, uh, Dr. Rosen and, and Dr. Miller were on a study where we looked at career choice and found that there were patterns within people's careers. If you were more of a, a, a verbal legal, um, you were more likely to have one sort of um, uh, atrophy pattern on one side, if you're more artistic uh, atrophy pattern on another side. So uh, potentially there is a connection there. We have to learn more. I guess I would say that the message, the message is, it's not necessarily whether you're gonna have a problem like this or not, but how it's gonna manifest itself. And I think that helps us a lot with understanding the biology of these things and recognizing what'll happen. And that was the message in that paper too. Everybody had a problem, that's why they were in the paper, but it's just how it manifests itself. Yeah, so an, 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 an issue of targeting, that um, the disease process is potentially sort of outside, and, and the brain is you, and, and your personality, your hand preference, your, your career choice, and, and how um, uh, that disease uh, affects you uh, is going to be very personal. Uh, and so that's hopefully going to help us uh, predict um, uh, disease and, and hopefully prevent uh, disease. Co comment on, on uh, Zach's work and why I think it's so important. So I, I think, you know, we're, we're thinking a lot more broadly about this than, than we ever did. And I, I think we're born with a certain brain. And we know that left-handers' brains are different at birth than right-handers. They're more symmetrical. They're more likely to be ambidextrous. Um, uh, they're less specialized for language. Uh, we, so that's one story. We, uh, uh, are organized in certain ways that I think lead us along specific pathways. So, um, you know, I was never going to be a uh, car mechanic. Uh, the systems in my brain uh, weren't really finely tuned for those kind of skills, nor was I strongly attracted to that. So I had my own trajectory, my own kind of systems that were stronger and weaker, and uh, I followed the systems that were stronger, like most of us do. Then there's another story that happens as we're uh, growing up, and that is how we fine tune these circuits that we're given. Uh, and I think one of the elegant things that we're learning uh, from our Global Brain Health Institute, Elisa Resende just uh, uh, has uh, published a really important paper, I think, and in her area of Brazil, 35% of people are illiterate. So unbelievable, no reading. Uh, they know that if you have at least four years of education, you have a smaller, uh, at least a bigger hippocampus, this memory area, than people who don't have four years of education. So this is a story about how very early on with our grandchildren and children, we can help change the way their brains are structured, probably protecting them later in life. So this is, I think, the second part of uh, Zach's story. And then I think, you know, the work that uh, was presented by Caitlin, uh, uh, Bob and Jennifer working in this space, a, a number of people, is that even as we get older, these vulnerable circuits that we have uh, that may be more vulnerable to neurodegenerative diseases can probably be protected with interventions. So for example, in Brazil, Elisa is now working with the government in Belo Horizonte to bring literacy to these uh, people with less than four years of education who have small hippocampi. Uh, already the bet is that uh, that training program after the age of 50 is going to make a difference, is going to enlarge the hippocampus, make it less vulnerable. So I, I think these are, you know, the ways that Zach's story is being weaved into our understanding of neurodegenerative disease. If you're dyslexic, are you more pro, pro, predisposed to Alzheimer's? Probably not. But maybe you get it a little younger in a language area that's already vulnerable. So I, I think all the things that we do throughout the lifespan to strengthen our circuits is really probably important later in life as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we, we, we got to move on. Uh. <laughs> yeah.
Okay, so I got a question about what's the ideal duration of sleep? We're thinking about seven and a half to eight and a half hours is what we should be targeting, closer to the eight and a quarter. Um, do sleep disruptions increase with menopause? Does it affect cognition if we have um, hormone-related sleep disruption? Unfortunately, yes, we think so. Um, and sleep disruptions do increase with menopause, especially hot flashes, but not in everyone. So what's unclear still is why are some people vulnerable to this sleep disruption during this phase of life, and why does it extend in some people throughout um, aging, and why are other people pretty pretty robust against the changing levels of hormones. Uh, recuperating from sleep deprivation really depends on whether it's acute or chronic. So one night of sleep deprivation or losing an hour tonight, we can pretty easily recapture that. But if, you, if we're going for years of chronic sleep loss, so hitting the five and a half, six hours, that's really hard to recuperate from. Um, and do older adults with sleep disruption, um, sorry, do older adults have sleep disruption? Yes, we are looking at specifically individuals who have really great sleep and really poor sleep and seeing, you know, are these people on different trajectories? We're trying to think about ways of improving their sleep. Um, do I recommend taking over-the-counter Tylenol PM or Ibuprofen PM? Absolutely not. Um, they are really bad for us, we'll have a leftover effect the following day. Avoid them, go to your doctor, try and see if there's a prescription, or try some sleep hygiene techniques. Does marijuana help? There is no evidence at the moment to really show that it helps, so I would probably avoid that. That's true, I should ask the audience, but um, as a sleep researcher, I would say I wouldn't necessarily rely on that or wine or any um, other aids for sleep. I try more the the active sleep hygiene methods. Um, feel free to contact me if you want to chat about that more. Thank you. All right, so I got a few questions that run along a general theme, but also a few questions that are very specific about certain treatments. So I think there may be some biochemists and pharmacists out there. Uh, for those, I'm happy to stay after and talk about those more specific treatments after. Um, so first of all, let's see. Um, is it correct to say that there are no new treatments for dementia in 2017 and any upcoming new treatments? So it's correct to say that in 2017, there's been no new FDA-approved treatments uh, for dementia. And, but you know, as Dr. Bruce Miller has said, this is really quite an exciting time for our field. Uh, this is really the first time there's been so many targeted treatments towards what we think are causing the disease coming from different angles, whether it's antibodies or ways to make the DNA not produce more bad proteins or ways to modify the proteins so they don't clump together. So it really is quite an exciting time and a lot of the big clinical trials using these uh, new treatments that's never been studied before are well on their way um, probably more than halfway through. So we're a lot of these we're expecting a readout in about 2020. So that's out in about two years' time. It will be an exciting time for a lot of these results to be revealed. Uh, let's see. And another question is kind of long. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. So what are your thoughts on the idea that causal factors of dementia are multifaceted and whether uh, treatment by individual protocols, a single factor is really a silver bullet. So I'm gonna interpret this as meaning whether um, dementia can really be treated by just one drug or whether you need a combination of drugs or a lot of different types of drugs. And I think that's something uh, that we're learning more and more from these negative results that I showed today that that is probably the way it's gonna go. For example, stopping amyloid production with these base inhibitors probably does not work once you already have a lot of amyloid in your brain or you're already showing symptoms. So it probably only works when it's very, very early on, whereas these tau treatments may work later on. And the FDA actually has very strict guidelines in terms of how you can run a clinical trial using a combination of drugs. You need to really show that each individual drug has a reasonable mechanism of working together and that individually they have a reasonable evidence of creating some sort of beneficial effect. So we're not quite there yet, but I think we're getting there as we learn more and more about these diseases and what makes them tick and how the drugs are acting. 
along those lines, another question is, how can you identify people who are asymptomatic for early treatment? So that's a great question. As I mentioned, a lot of these drug trials are going earlier and earlier and earlier. That doesn't mean that they're just going out on the streets and recruiting everyone they see and say, come in to get a drug. They're actually using a lot of these observational population studies that we've been running, not just at UCSF, but all over the world, to identify what risk factors causes someone who's 50 or above, 60 or above, to develop more memory problems. So these can be the presence of amyloid on a PET scan or in their cerebral spinal fluid, or these can be having certain genes that increase your risk of memory loss. Uh, as Caitlin has shown, when people age, some people get worse, some people don't, and um, you know, just because you have amyloid in your brain or these certain genes doesn't mean you necessarily get Alzheimer's dementia or other memory problems. So these studies are very hard to do. That's why they usually run five years or longer and recruit thousands and thousands of patients, but it's on the way and hopefully we'll learn more about it. Uh, okay. As, as Caitlin comes up, I just think it's, it's worth mentioning uh, this concept of precision medicine gets brought up a lot, and uh, it's used, I think, in many ways by different people, but I feel like the question that, that, um, uh, that Richard answered was kind of the right one to sort of bring up that point that I think that's the goal of precision medicine. So all of these things that we talk about like inflammation and all the proteins, they interact differently in different people and for some people inflammation may not be an important target to add in to the, the, to the thinking about how to treat them and for other people it might and there are many uh, varieties of that point I just said. So I think that question really touched on this precision medicine idea, and for those people who hear that term a lot, it's one example of how we think about that. So, go ahead, Kate. All right, we had some great questions. Too many for me to answer, so I'm happy to stay after and answer more, but I think there are a couple of themes, at least. Um, one is around um, exercise, when someone has a cognitive problem already, is that helpful? And I think uh, actually some of the work that I was showing today also demonstrates that even in people with mild cognitive problems, those were all in, in trials for exercise, have shown cognitive benefits. Um, so I think it's something that we can do, and as long as sort of it's motorically safe, that even those with um, sort of some cognitive problems online, exercise does seem to show some benefits. Um, and then other questions about, a lot of questions about diet. And I think this is kind of the trickiest area as you know, you, as we think more and more about diet, diet is so closely interlinked with lifestyle. So physical activity and what people do for work, it's very difficult to parse out what parts of diet seem to be most effective. What we can recommend at this point, I think, are definitely leafy greens, fruits and vegetables, um, maybe more whole grains, and uh, these seem to be associated with better cognitive outcomes with aging, but there haven't been a lot of great clinical trials on diet, um, so there were some questions about specific um, diet protocols that are going on, like the Bredesen diet. I think that the jury's still out. I think if you need to pay money for these types of diets. I'm not sure I would recommend that at this point unless it makes you feel really good and that's something that's within your comfort zone. Um, but I think that the evidence isn't quite there enough um, to be paying a lot of money towards uh, specialized diets. Um, mm -hmm. Please. Yeah. So, you know, some, some people like me, like, you know, it, when you go to a restaurant, like I, if the wine is a little more expensive, you know, it maybe enhances the taste of it. So, yeah, if you want to pay more money for like your diet, then yes, and it will enhance the quality of your life. That's good. But the data is not there. That, that's one thought. The second is like, um, I spent a whole uh, day in uh, Barcelona, Spain, where we thought about the Mediterranean diet. And I think there, uh, in general, the data is good. It's definitely not a cure. Uh, probably ha even has efficacy once you start to get a cognitive disorder. Um, you know, I think we, Cindy and I talked about this the other day. We're going to put on our website for free the Mediterranean <laughs> diet. Uh, uh, and, um, it, it, you know, a lot of questions yet. Uh, walnuts are an important part of this diet. And, uh, you know, uh, I, whether that's critical or not, and is there something in the walnut that's really important? I don't know. But it might be. And therefore, I think you should know what the, 
right Mediterranean diet is. Same, same with oil. There's a lot of olive oil in it. Um, and, you know, whether that is a critical component, we don't know yet. You know, we, we don't understand the pieces of the Mediterranean diet that are really critical. But I think the data is good, as uh, Caitlin said. And, and then also related to diet, a lot of questions about alcohol. Um, and so within the Mediterranean diet, there's actually recommendations to, to have about a glass or two of wine um, per day is okay. And in fact, associated with better cognitive outcomes. Um, and I think with everything in life, moderation is key. So uh, there are definitely evidence on the other end demonstrating that if there are heavy amounts of alcohol use, that that's actually quite bad for the brain. Uh, the brain can sort of rebound and bounce back from heavy amounts of alcohol use, but it's not good for the brain and it can cause permanent damage, especially when other aspects of the diet aren't in line. Um, but there is some ef efficacy, it seems, to, to wine specifically. This doesn't seem to translate to beer or to liquor at this point that we know, um, but uh, we'll have to see more again as the, the data play out. Um, Co cost of wine, oh, great question. Uh, I'm not sure the data are there yet, but <laughs> we'll let you know if two buck Chuck will do it. Um, okay, so the other questions were centered around um, brain training. So there's been a lot of information in the news, you know, maybe this isn't so helpful to engage in these computerized brain training programs. Um, so the data I showed uh, basically demonstrate that the more you um, train in a specific cognitive area, so if you train your processing speed or you train your memory, and then you go take one of our paper and pencil tests that are on processing speed or on memory, you do better on those tests. And that's exciting and it's hopeful for us, um, but the data aren't there to tell us, you know, what does that mean for that person in terms of day-to-day -day life? Does that mean that they're faster when they drive, they think faster when they're driving and reacting to people, or they can remember to take their medication? We're not sure. There's some self-reported evidence that seems to be helping in day-to-day -day life, but the data really aren't there yet. The data also aren't there to demonstrate that it prevents or um, slows cognitive decline with age. These are just sort of new concepts that are coming out. We just don't have the longe longevity of the data to show that it's actually preventative at this point. So our recommendations center around challenging your brain and doing things you enjoy doing cognitively. And so that can be um, crosswords and puzzles and engaging with your loved ones and your grandchildren. Um, it can also be taking up a new task like knitting or cooking. Um, I think if you can challenge your brain to make new connections, that's going to be the key aspect. And however you like to do that, whether that's a different video game or that's um, you know taking up a new hobby, I think that's the way that uh, we can probably best promote those connections in the brain. Okay, yeah. And coming to this event, all of your synapses are really getting tightened. Come back again next year, and your brain will continue to that upward trajectory. Um, and then the last um, couple questions about uh, traumatic brain injury and aging. And I think, you know, it's kind of common sense. If we hit our brains, it seems like it's actually not quite so good for our brains. So. Um, not too shocking. I, there's an increased risk of things like Alzheimer's disease when you have a, a traumatic brain injury, um, but it doesn't mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. So what can we do if we've had a traumatic brain injury? I think um, a lot of uh, the, the pieces that we've been talking about, so really maintaining that vascular health with your physical exercise and your, you know lowering your blood pressure to make sure the clearance mechanisms of the brain so those blood vessels are intact and helping you um, sort of promote that brain, brain growth after having a traumatic brain injury can be helpful. Um, and in terms of um, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE. Um, so this is something that, uh, unless you've played football or a repetitive, repetitive head injury um, as a kid, uh, I'm not sure um, anyone here falls into that camp, um, but it's something that we're actively interested in, um, but we're, we're still parsing out as well. Um, so having one head injury or having a couple head injuries, we're not sure where the line is, but I think maintaining a healthy lifestyle around the head injury is the most critical factor at this time. I think that's probably all I have time for, but happy to answer other questions afterwards. Um, so I didn't get any questions. That probably means that my presentation was super on point <laughs> and very clear. 
um, there, was, <laughs> there was an inquiry about um, how to get a hold of the presentation and perhaps you can clarify that later. I did want to take a second um, just to note, which I didn't before, but really Dr. Bruce Miller is the visionary leader behind GBHI and making sure that we are part of the six uh, programs that were funded and securing that funding and really creating that vision. And Dr. Howie Rosen is uh, the one responsible for our curriculum and our training experience and really building um, a very tailored curriculum that works for an interprofessional group of people, some who, you know, some are experts in psychology and others in policy. Um, and so that all of them walk away with a core skill set in various areas. Point being that if you do have questions afterwards, I really think that um, Dr. Rosen and Dr. Miller will be great sources of information. Um, and there's some brochures on the table as well. Um, hi, I know we're, we're running late, so I'll be really quick. And um, first question, need clarification for how to see the next video. Um, uh, one is to give me coffee a lot. Uh, that will make it happen sooner. Um, if you're on Facebook, uh, we have, there's a page called Citizen Brain with Josh Kornbluth, Kornbluth with a K. And if you go and like that page, you'll release endorphins in me, and you'll also always hear about it. The other, two, the other three places are, uh, it's also on YouTube and on Vimeo. If you go to my Josh Kornbluth YouTube or Citizen Brain YouTube, you can subscribe. And on Vimeo, you can subscribe to the Josh Kornbluth, whatever it is, the Vimeo thing. Um, also, you can go to joshkornbluth.com. Amazingly, it was available. And uh, <laughs> you can sign up for my e-list, and then you'll find out about everything that I do, uh, and that'd be really cool. Okay, uh, and you can all reach me, and I encourage you to email me at josh at joshkornbluth.com or through GBHI. Um, question, next question, how do you empathize with tweets? <laughs> so I actually, when I saw it, I laughed, you know? I laughed and I, yeah, it's a, oh, it's, it's a funny joke, but then I thought, wait, the kids from Stoneman Douglas High School, the, the survivors of the horrible shooting, they have been showing incredible empathy, among other things that they're showing, with their tweets, where they just consistently, uh, like, belying their youth, <laughs> they consistently seek to join with other people and never to separate, never in any of their tweets. So I think that's a really beautiful thing. I also want to mention that Sarah Conrath, the researcher I mentioned uh, early on in the video, she's actually, she has a study not about she may be working on tweets, I don't know, but she has a study that was really cool about texting, where she's taking t teenagers and texting to make them more empathetic with each other by having like prompts of test, text, you know, the saying, you know, how, why do you love me, or <laughs> stuff like that. I don't know, I just made that one up. That's why I'm not in science. But she's using texting to actually draw kids together. And so, um, yeah. Um, do we have an empathy black hole in the White House? <laughs> Sh should the Mac intervene? <laughs> and uh, speaking for myself, the answer is yes and yes. Uh, Empathy, have you been able to establish a baseline of empathy? What's normal? Now I could answer that, but it would come out sounding so scientific and abstruse that I think it might be better to put it in just sort of more normal language if Dr. Miller, oh, oh no, actually if uh, uh, Bob Levinson answers it. So I'm gonna bring up Bob Levinson. Do you have any other questions? Oh, that's, that's all the questions that I had that weren't about my mental state. So, <laughs> hard act to follow, right? <laughs> so just, just something that may not be immediately op uh, obvious, but in this realm of emo our emotional lives, the answer is almost always the same, and that is um, too little, not so good, too much, not so good. And even with empathy, um, 
So let's start with the easy thing. If you need a card that says, you know, respond that, that you care, if you have that little empathy, that's probably not a very good place to be. And, and, and I think we would all agree about that. And I think that was Josh's me me um, message. Now let's think about something that's not so obvious. How about if you're the kind of person who just suffers every slight of every other person in your life who takes on the pain of your of your kids and the people in your care and the people you love if you can't really read the newspaper without suffering for you know sharing the pain of everyone else who's suffering it turns out that even though you might be a, you know a noble person that that is not very good for your health and um, and so there is a band there between too little and too much that would be the, the sort of the normal healthy baseline and that's what we have to shoot for and you know you see in um, in psychiatry certainly uh, you, you see people who who do take have too much empathy they do suffer for for too many others but um, the, it's interesting I, I don't know if there are any neurological diseases that really uh, create that but it is uh, something to be thinking about and uh, Sorry? Yeah, yeah, and, and Williams syndrome and things like that. There are a few kind of oddball ones, but uh, by and large, when we have brain diseases of the brain, our empathy goes down. But uh, in normal life, we have to watch that it not it, we not take on too much of other people's suffering. You know, that's the one thing that's interesting. Uh, uh, Virginia Sturm, who uh, who was uh, featured in Josh's thing, she has an interesting study that suggests that. In Alzheimer's, at some stages of the disease, people might actually become more empathic than they were earlier. And um, we're not sure why. It might be that as some of the other cognitive processes slow down, they were interfering with this human capability to connect. So one of the things I think we always want to be mindful of as we watch the course of, of neurodegenerative diseases is not only what's lost, and, that, and that's pretty prominent. But what's maintained? And, and there may even be moments where things uh, become sharper and stronger. And those are to be celebrated. I've got a lot of some of the smartest questions I've ever been given. And I'm going to go rapid fire because I know a lot of you are hungry. Okay, um, is any working, anyone working on dementia caused by many strokes? Without a doubt, this is a very important question. Uh, the older we get, the more likely we are to show small little vascular uh, changes in the brain. Uh, these are not trivial. They eventually accumulate and cause cognitive issues. Uh, in our healthy aging group, we're learning a lot about this uh, with Joel Kramer, Caitlin, and we have a new fac uh, faculty member, Fanny Alahi, who is focused on this area. And, and I think one of the reasons that all of the positive lifestyle things that you all do uh, is good for the brain is that it's preventing these vascular changes. Uh, so yeah, I, I could say a lot more, and I'll, I'll stay later if, if, if you want to ask more specific questions. How about retinal testing? Some of you have participated in our retinal testing. We look at the back of the eye. Uh, this is very uh, exciting area because the optic nerve is part of the brain. Uh, and so I think sometimes we can understand, it's the only way we can really visualize what's going on in the brain. Um, uh, it's not yet there as a, a tool where we can look in the back of your eye and say you are at risk for Alzheimer's disease or in the early stages, but these are some of the things that we're trying to develop and get better at, and, and maybe eventually this will be a non-invasive way of uh, uh, helping to think about early um, uh, uh, stages of these diseases. Um, absence of specific genetic links, what explains dementia passed down through family members. So a couple comments. Jen Yokoyama uh, is now looking at our whole Alzheimer cohort and for the first time ever getting whole genome. That means every single gene in the brain uh, is being analyzed uh, across our cohorts. 
the healthy people here who don't have Alzheimer's disease are very important to that study. Your genes are also getting analyzed, every single one of them. So I think that uh, we are thinking that there are probably genetic forms of the disease that are very complicated that uh, this whole genome analysis may, may, help, may help us to understand. The other thing about families, uh, you know, they're shared risk factors. Uh, so uh, if you lived in an area where uh, uh, pollution was high, uh, brothers and sisters might have a little higher prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. But I think the genetics is also going to be a very important to help understand how the environment plays with the, the genes uh, to predispose to diseases. Okay. Read an article in NPR that said d DNA editing was an being used in studies to treat ALS. It's also being used uh, for FTD, question mark. Great question. So one of the forms of frontotemporal dementia uh, that we are going to use this editing uh, to uh, think about treating is a form associated with Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS. Uh, and I think uh, Tim Miller at Washington University, a number of other really brilliant people across the country are figuring out ways of turning off bad genes in the brain. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, this uh, genetic editing is on its way. Uh, also talk with somebody earlier that uh, our Parkinson's group is uh, thinking of smart ways to deliver genes uh, into the brain uh, through different cells. We're also thinking about that in our progranulin study. So this wild uh, science fiction, uh, you know, genetic editing idea is really coming uh, to brain science uh, very quickly. Um, why are there so few African-American people presenting in, in, in the audience? Why? Yeah, we're, we're not uh, happy or proud about that. Uh, you know, I think some of it is the demographics of San Francisco. And I think for a lot of reasons, uh, uh, some of them economic, African-American people are being pushed out of uh, uh, San Francisco. Even areas that were traditionally very str uh, strongly African-American, like Bayview, uh, are having fewer and fewer African-American people. The same is true of Oakland. Uh, so, at, you know, I think our global brain health uh, program, uh, uh, we have uh, gone out of our way historically to work with the Asian community in San Francisco. Francisco. Uh, now Sergio Lanada uh, is leading effort with our Latino communities. Uh, it's not enough to be here. We have to go to those communities. Um, as we start to think about uh, training people from Africa, uh, the Caribbean, um, uh, I think more and more we will be able to deliver these kinds of programs. But San Francisco is an area for a lot of cultural reasons where uh, this isn't as simple as uh, some place like Baltimore, St. Louis, where there are large African-American communities uh, uh, there. Uh, okay. In the early uh, uh, stages of undiagnosed FTD, my concerns of social justice, reemployment, uh, and uh, disability entitlement, example of undiagnosed clients is fired for problems at work. Shouldn't there be some kind of protection accommodations? if employed uh, with a hidden uh, disability? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great, great question. And so I think, um, you know, we have learned, and when we look back at people who we diagnose with frontotemporal dementia or Alzheimer's disease, sometimes the first time there were uh, uh, manifestations of the illness were at work, with interacting with people at work, and uh, uh, these are people who uh, sometimes get laid off of work. And absolutely, I think if this was the cause for them to be laid off, uh, this uh, should uh, have uh, disability implications. And uh, we work with people around this space, and I think it's really a, a very important and, uh, question. Are you coordinating data with the VA? Yeah, so Christine Yaffe and Raquel Gardner are our two major collaborators at the VA, both major thinkers, leaders in uh, falls, uh, Parkinson's, traumatic brain injury, and so, yes, and we've always had a sister clinic at the VA where uh, patients were seen. Cindy Barton was a leader in that clinic, and uh, um, uh, so, yes, we're still working very strongly with the VA. Oh, Raquel Gardner and Christine Yaffe, Y-A-F-F-E. Um, okay, I've had concussion syndrome 63 years. What, if any, impact does that have on my long-term memory health. Uh, effects of cannabis use on memory, uh, started use 25 years, light use. And then can you as experts see people with memory, assess them? Yes, so 
yes, if you have memory problems, we want to see you think about uh, this. Uh, sometimes uh, memory symptoms are very benign. Sometimes uh, they're caused by something simple like a thyroid deficiency. Other times, uh, you know, they may be the beginnings of a degenerative disease. Uh, we did a really nice study, David Perry, uh, thinking at huge databases uh, about risks following mild traumatic uh, uh, brain um, injury. Uh, the punchline was, yes, it's a risk factor for a number of different disorders, but not a huge risk factor. So I think for Alzheimer's disease, about 1.5 times expected risk uh, for Parkinson's, something like that. So I think many people in this room uh, have had a subtle uh, mild traumatic brain injury the, the relative risk for this is, is really pretty low. Uh, so much lower than being hypertensive, much lower than uh, having uncontrolled diabetes. So a, a risk, a little risk, but, and I think Caitlin said this well, it's a lot different than being a football player who may have the head jarred, you know, every single play. That, that, that's a very different risk and uh, uh, something that I think really needs societal attention. Um, are there any studies on music in the brain? Yeah, I, I just go back to what I said a little bit earlier. I think really, really important to think about um, brains of our uh, grandchildren, children, great-grandchildren. Really nice data about children who play uh, musical instruments, violin. Uh, they have actually bigger structures in the motor coordinating systems of the brain. Uh, there is no doubt that enriching the brain when we are young and even older is good for the brain. Uh, Bob uh, called me the Dick Clark of uh, whatever, but uh, you know, he knows how much I love music and uh, uh, listen to it uh, constantly. I, I'm sure it's good for my brain. Even better for my brain was uh, I, I took up singing for a brief while with Heidi Claire, and uh, I, I'm sure that it, it protected me uh, till I'm 100 at least. Uh, just that one year of singing. It, it's been tremendous. And uh, finally, just one thanks to our, uh, our uh, family caregiver advisors, uh, Bob Lumberg, Helen Netsker here, and you guys have helped us enormously. Keep telling us what we're doing right, but also things that we should do better, because we are on a constant, Rosalie Gerhardt has taught me this, constantly reiteration of how we can give back more. So thank you. Just one more thing. So uh, uh, just reminding you that, that, exact, that Bruce has ended on the last and most important note is the feedback. One way that you can give feedback is by filling out the uh, feedback uh, forms on your tables. Please do leave them up front or with any of the staff here. We'll collect them and think about ways to um, improve this in the future. Thanks, everyone, for coming again. And have a good rest of the day and weekend. <laughs>